All right. Um, yes. So welcome again, everybody. Um, yeah, let's start from the beginning. Sorry again for this technical issue, um, but I'm glad to see more and more people here. So, so yeah, let's start today's webinar. Okay, may I start? Yes, please. Good. Okay, so sorry for these technical difficulties. Anyhow, welcome again very much in a second, second try. Welcome very much on this uh, afternoon uh, webinars focusing on uh, wilderness in Europe. As you maybe some of you remember last week, we presented uh, the first part of European Wilderness Network focusing on the northern part of Europe, including the Norway, Sweden, Finland, but also Germany and uh, Baltic countries. In this time, we would like to focus on Central Europe and Western Europe, from Portugal, from Portuguese to the Georgia. And but at the beginning, we would like to explain a little bit few. We would like to say a few words uh, about the wilderness and the wilderness network, just as a kind of uh, introduction to the subject. Okay. First of all, short introduction of the Zoom software for for you participants. There is audio setting you can go for mute and unmute. I would recommend you during the presentations to have a click the unmute so everybody can listen and uh, understand well what we are going to present. There will be opportunity to ask questions and provide answers. Also likely maybe at the end uh, there will be chat so we can freely discuss on, uh, on, uh, on the computer. In the case of that you have a specific questions during the presentations, please use the chat box and you can write down the question and my colleagues help me to find out what is, what is it and uh, provide me technical support. Okay. So first of all, a short introduction, European Wilderness Society. It's the only pan-European organization, non-profit organization focusing on wilderness and environmental advocacy. Uh, this is uh, all organization is running by a dedicated multicultural and experienced professional team of the different experts from different uh, fields like wilderness and wildlife specialists, nature conservationists, but also we have a, a lot of contacts and partners among the community of researchers and scientists, including the tourism experts, marketing and business professionals people dealing with the communication layout and the professional communication issues, in also legal advisors and a wide spectrum of uh, volunteers working as a, what we call the wilderness advocates. Let's say in a nutshell, into organizations uh, where the main objective of this uh, international nonprofit organization is uh, to build European wilderness network as a tool to protect uh, European wilderness. Good. As you can see from this slide, uh, European Wilderness Society has a, a, diff, a, a clearly defined mission, which means to identify the European wilderness, to find out where it is, how, quality standard, to, if that wilderness is designated according to the particular country legislation and legislative framework. Also how these last fragments of wilderness in Europe is managed or steward, which is even better word as we understand because the wilderness stewards should first of all should ask questions by themselves. If it is necessary to do any kind of management procedure, what they in a first moment believe it's important. And uh, last uh, but not least uh, element, what we are focusing on is promote these uh, most valuable fragments and elements of Europe still, pro still saved and protected throughout this European continent. During the last years, we find out actually that the uh, wilderness context was very much focusing on terrestrial ecosystems, completely kind of ignored uh, elements uh, in the nature like rivers, coast, islands, etc. And therefore, the recently uh, was invented uh, or uh, identified, I would put it like that better, uh, identified uh, four additional subcategories, uh, which is a wild rivers, wild coast, wild islands, and wild forest. Why? Because uh, most of these subcategories has a different uh, size and different technical uh, uh, details. What means to protect the wild rivers? Because it's a usually a uh, length of the river, including the coast 
on the both side of the river. Wild coast, it's a similar habitat uh, like, like line along the coast, including the marine and terrestrial ecosystem. And the islands is basically no, no difference between wild island and the wilderness is that islands has no size limit, for example, because islands uh, itself create a kind of complex ecosystem surrounded by the sea. But anyhow, in the case of this uh, subcategory, we always try to add, uh, if it is possible, as large as possible piece of uh, marine or sea land, uh, including the terrestrial part of island. Uh, our organization is also very much dedicated to the education for the next generation with a focus on wilderness. Okay, next one, please. So first, I would like also introduce a little bit myself. My name is uh, Vlado Vlado Vančura. I am a Slovakian. Currently, I am based in Slovakia in my office, um, home, home office. Northern part of Slovakia, I am based between uh, high and low Tatra mountains. And from one window, I can see and explore the high Tatras. And from a second window, I can experience the low Tatra mountains. Both are national parks here in Slovakia, and both belongs to the Carpathian mountain system. Uh, I have a background as a forestry and resource management, and I spent uh, working at the beginning of my career several years for Forest Service and Forest Planning Institute. But then later on, I completely jumped into the nature conservation and specifically to the wilderness conservation, where I am heavily involved in the last uh, 30, 35 years, collecting experience all over the Europe, but also in the United States in working for your know, National Park Service or Parks Canada, but also on the other side of the uh, planet, like uh, Soviet, previous uh, Russia, uh, previous Soviet Union, sorry, current Russia territory, etc., and many other European countries. Currently, I am uh, working as a vice chairman of European Wilderness Society based in the northern part of Slovakia. And uh, my main objective, my main expertise is to contribute and coordinate. European Wilderness Network, searching for new potential partners, searching for committed individuals, etc. And then that's a basically my short introduction. Thanks. At the beginning, there was a lot of discussion, actually. Beginning means almost 25, 28 years ago, a lot of discussions. If we actually still have some fragments of wilderness saved in Europe because of history, because of a lot of pressure, and uh, disturbances done by the he heavily dense population all over the Europe. Nevertheless, 25, 26 years ago, it was decided and it was uh, find out based on the study that there are still some fragments left and makes sense actually to start speak and talk quite loudly about the, this uh, wilderness heritage uh, based in the Europe. Since the beginning, there was a quite clear that there are two kind of uh, type or two, that, two different categories, what we can clearly define actually existing uh, areas which has no human impact, yeah? kind of fragments of old growth forest, for example, or all other different ecosystem, what was decided that this is going to be the wilderness, but then there was a lot of uh, self-restoration process going on all over Europe and the size of that area usually was much, much smaller. And that was decided that this is going to be kind of wide, uh, wide area. And based on that, that two definition was developed. For wide areas uh, was decided or recommended that in this area, there is a high level of predominance of natural processes and the natural habitats. They tend to be individually smaller, more fragmented than wilderness areas although they often cover extensive tracts. The conditions of their natural habitats, processes, and relevant species is, however, often partially or substantially modified by past human activities, such as traditional use, livestock herding, hunting, fishing, and collecting berry and mushrooms. The important in this moment is to identify if these human activity are still going on in these potential wild areas, or if there is a chance or per perspective that they will be gradually reduced and maybe later on completely removed and stopped. Okay. 
So second category, original one, which was actually at the beginning of the people behind this context uh, on concept in Europe was a wilderness. And that wilderness definition is saying that wilderness, wilderness areas are governed by open-ended, undefined natural processes. Because we believe that we cannot predict what is going to happen in this area, particularly also because of uh, ongoing climate changes, changes what we are now exposed. So any kind of way of thinking that we would like to see in this specific habitat, for example, the beech forest, and today it is a spruce forest, it's, it's uh, misguiding and we don't, don't, don't take, uh, we don't do that uh, in, in a practical life. We basically are searching for, I will say it again, open-ended, undefined natural processes. They are composed of native habitats and species and large enough for the effective ecological functioning of natural processes. This is also kind of tricky issue. What means effective ecological functioning processes and large enough? But then uh, we learn during the practical implementation of this process and based on that experience, we basically developed the European Wilderness Quality Standard, which also includes at the beginning on a first principle kind of size limit or recommendations of the number of hectares, what needs to be fulfilled for each wilderness criterion or category. They are, these areas are unmodified or only slightly modified and without intrusive or extractive human activity, settlements, infrastructure, or visual disturbances. In a practice, this means that even if some areas, particularly wild area category, used to have this kind of extractive human activity, for example, or settlements, but they have been for various reasons stopped or removed and not going on uh, again, this area can start to be promoted or discussed and uh, sooner or later maybe even included to the European Wilderness Network. Okay. Next one, please. This is a draft. Sorry, this is this is a scheme which uh, visually is explaining where the wilderness is actually understand where the wilderness is located in the European context. With the name of the this this graph is a wilderness continuum, and maybe I would like bring your attention to the bottom part of this picture. Where is a line going the, from uh, uh, left hand side to the right hand side, from uh, low quality wilderness to the high quality wilderness, as you can see. And then in the middle, there is a, some low or medium quality, which is an uh, area, which is an uh, interval where the active or passive rewilding is usually happening, which basically in some areas, in certain moments, can reach the quality standard where they are qualified to become the member of European Wilderness Network, either in the category of bronze or others, okay? Wilderness actually, according to wilderness definition means to be to, just to focus on one of a basically quite important uh, quality standard uh, principle, that there are no human extractions in that area. That means Nothing is taken out from the particular ecosystems proposed to become the wilderness. In a practical life, that means that there is no hunting, no logging or forestry operation, no mining or mineral collection, or, and even the deadwood collection, it's an issue what is carefully considered and shouldn't be in a proposed wilderness, particularly in a wilderness with a golden stamp or, or platinum standard. There are no human intervention in this area besides the tourism experience and our research. There are no disease or alien species control, which is a quite controversial issue because uh, even due to the climate changes and, ch and, and impact of the different non-native species in the area, et cetera, et cetera. And there are no ongoing restoration measures already in that area. They could happen special restoration focus to start or launch the natural dynamic processes before the, this audit, European Wilderness audit process. But during the, pro, during the membership of Euro, in European Wilderness Network, these restoration measures should be active, restoration measures should be actually already stopped. Other simple and nice definition, I like it very much, is saying that wilderness is open-ended, 
undefined natural dynamic process. Okay, next one, please. European Wilderness Network, after the several years of heavy discussions and work and, this, and meeting the people in the field, park management, we managed to identify the key partners, usually managers who starts the work and believe and like this concept of wilderness. And they work in that direction already, some of them for decades, some for a few years, but they simply personally believe that it is important to protect the wilderness. European Wilderness Society actually provide them support and help. And uh, that area, the product of the several many years of work we were invited and after the international audit included to the European Wilderness Network. Currently, there are 41 members covering uh, Europe from north to south, from Portugal to, to the Ural Mountains on, on the east side of the Europe. And uh, these areas are scattered from all of the Europe, not only Eastern European countries, but also Nordic, Scandinavia, or, or Mediterranean, etc. Obviously, in some area, they are more often more frequent. In other areas, they are much less frequent. There are more than 350,000 hectares of audited wilderness based on the European Wilderness Quality Standard and Audit System, which is uh, basically techniques or quality standard which used as a tool for international verifiers when they go to the field and supposed to come with an outcome or result or recommendation if that particular area is fitting to the wilderness definition. Uh, but the challenge during this process, during this audit, is actually discussion about wilderness management versus wilderness stewardship. What I already mentioned at the beginning uh, briefly, which is mu much more philosophical context, wilderness stewardship to understand and implement if there is actually need for any kind of human interaction or inter intervention to the area proposed as a wilderness not only from the human perspective, but specifically from the self-will self -will land process. So the, there is a non-intervention stewardship as a fundamental uh, conditions during, during this process, which is subject of audit and, and check and discussion. And obviously we are searching for various habitat, which should be included to the European Wilderness Network just to prove that actually the spontaneous re uh, rewilding process is ongoing on all of Europe, doesn't matter on habitat, even if some habitat are during the decades are changing because of, of uh, dynamic processes happening inside the nature or even do because of the climate change, for example. Okay, next one, please. So this is a various wilderness type, what we now have, uh, included or representing inside the European Wilderness Network, starting from the left top, it's a marine, marine wilderness or island wilderness. <coughs> Going to the, to the right, it's a the wild coastline along the North German border, the Jasmund wilderness, and then the wild forests, which uh, it's uh, small fragments of forest still almost untouched or sometimes even in the old growth uh, positions, old growth stuff. And uh, on the bottom right, it's uh, fragments of the wild uncontrolled uh, un river systems, which can be found not only in Scandinavia as which one, is, uh, as this one in uh, Aulanka, but also in Central Europe, as you will see in the coming minutes. Next one, please. So this is the way how we try to visualize the quality standard of the, of the wilderness after the successful audit. Very much depends on the size, but also depends on the quality standard of the wilderness. They can be included or involved in the four different categories, starting from bronze, larger, better means silver, even larger and even better, that better means less human impact and more wild scenes. It can be gold and the top of this is a platinum, usually more than 10,000 hectares with non-intervention areas in one, preferably the fragment of a piece of land well protected. 
Okay. This is the territory or part of Europe, what we are going to present the wilderness today. As you can see from the very left hand side at the northern edge of the Portugal through the Central Europe, Mediterranean country, Italy, Balkan, and we will end up uh, later on in uh, Turkey and finally in Georgia in the Lesser Caucasus. Good. Next one, please. So first uh, wilderness, first wilderness we are going to visit today, and I see Peneda Jerez wilderness, wilderness, uh, likely the double wilderness is because that's a very, very unique area. Uh, in this case, uh, maybe it would be useful to tell you that at the beginning, the minimum size for wilderness was a 10,000 hectares, because that was the conditions or, or way of thinking if you want to invite the people who can experience and explore the wilderness, we simply need the size. So it was a kind of compromise that 10,000 hectares can accommodate certain number of people, visitors, and also to guarantee the spontaneous nature processes going on, in this case, the Greenland inside of Peneda Jarech. In this specific case in Portugal, that was the area uh, which was uh, actually the admitted to the network already 2007, based on a certain exceptions agreed by the executive board, because that was only 5,000 hectares. But there was a, a lot of work done during that process where the proposal was developed, document actually developed, which uh, proposed and come with a map and process how additional 5,000 hectares will be identified and finally enlarge this area. Second option was, because that's a borderline between the Portugal and, and, uh, and Spain, that actually on the Spain side, there is also protected area and part of that can also contribute with a few hectares of wilderness and enlarge the Peneda Jerez. So as you can see, there are several very interesting biomes combining in this area. And because we are in a Mediterranean country, not very far from the Atlantic Ocean, diversity of this wilderness is really astonishing. Next one, please. There are more than 800 plant species identified. There, is a, there are fragments of what we can, in a certain extent, say old growth or old forest with a maple, Portugal laurel, and predominant oak, which has been actually in the past century quite heavily impacted by the, by, by the local people, but in the last decades completely abandoned and uh, due to the spontaneous nature processes very nicely self-recovered. Also the animals, uh, uh, rare animals can be found in this area, still like Spanish ibex, Pyrenean desmond, golden eagle, and even the, the wolf. So remote, very re remote area, but and very specific due to the very, very high biodiversity and interesting history where we can see the spontaneous natural processes in the land which has been heavily impacted by the man already not for century, but maybe for millennia. Just for inter uh, as a short notes, yeah, fine, let's go, go ahead. Just as a short notes to let you know that actually in this case, the natural researchers and scientists and managers are not able to exactly identify what kind of natural habitat supposed to be there before the men arrived, which is uh, much easier to do it in Central Europe, but here in this Mediterranean country, almost impossible. From these four pictures, you can see just examples representative of the different ecosystem, like the wild, the heavy, dense forests, small creeks and a river, and interesting geological formations and high remote mountains, which are not easily accessible. Even using the local trail, it's a quite demanding and, and a remote trip. Good. So let's move to the second uh, Mediterranean country, but uh, much more in uh, east direction, Mayela, Mayela wilderness, Italy. Italy has a very interesting story from our point of view, because we never thought that actually like two hours from the Rome towards the east, we can find such a large area, in this case, almost 16,000 hectares of abundant land 
and land which has not been used by the men already for several decades. And because of very focused park management of the local local managers, that area completely nicely fit to the European wilderness quality standard. And in 2005, it became the member of European wilderness network and because of size, almost 16,000 hectares, it reached to the platinum quality standard. Recently, two years ago, there was an officially international re-audit where the border and line of the wilderness has been much more precisely delineated and uh, all this uh, context concept of the wilderness in uh, Mayela and the surroundings has been heavily supported and well communicated on an international base. Amazing on this wilderness is, uh, for example, this mountainous uh, massif, which starts uh, on a foothill from 130 meters about sea level and climbing up almost to the 3,000 meters. For, that includes uh, many different vegetation zones and many different forests. For, there is a, in the tree line, there is a last of, one of the last fragments of the dwarf pine in Apennine, Apennine mountains. And then obviously beech forest, fragments of old growth black pine forest, etc. Next one, please. This is just few, a couple of pictures illustrating the biodiversity number of rare remnants of alpine, of Apennines, sorry, Apennines old growth black pine forests, because most of the rest has been heavily locked during the previous historical time, and few fragments of a dwarf pine, endangered species as Apennine wolf, Marsicano bear, a wildcat, and nice spectrum of the, uh, of the birds, honey buzzards, woodpeckers, and number of endemic plants because of the climate, because of the various ecological conditions and habitats. Good. Here you can see different pictures from this wilderness. From the left top, uh, a lot of creeks, rivers are coming out of the mountains because there is a lot of precipitations in the wintertime three, four meters of the snow on the top of the mountains. And you can imagine how far to the south this area is located. So it's a quite, quite astonishing. But that impact of that, it's a dramatic remote mountains, not easy accessible. Only few tourist trails are climbing up to the mountains and strong hikers can have to spend quite a few hours to get there on their own. Just imagine starting the hiking from 200 meters and going to the 3000 meters, it is really quite kind of demanding exercise. On the right hand side, you see the scenic and the scenery of the mountains uh, on the top of the mountains of Mayela with the dwarf pine forest in, uh, in, in, in the front line. Okay. Hohe Tauren, let's go to Austria. Hohe Tauren, it's the highest mountains in Austria. It's a part of the Alps already. And there are actually three protected area, three parks. Each one has a name, the Hohe Tauren, but because of different province, they have three different man management uh, entities and three different uh, protected area legally they are actually created. However, the smart park managers, directors, they try to manage this area as a one ecological unit. One of them on the Salzburg territory, you can see this green patch, decided to identify the really last fragments of uh, high level uh, wilderness inside of this Hohe Tauren National Park. That area has a 6,700 hectares, so it's a quite high, but it's a mostly stretching above existing tree line because land here, it's a very much privately owned and it's not so easy to remove any kind of traditional use, which is a grazing and even a forestry outside of these green zones. In, uh, in the 2015, this area has been successfully uh, verified by the international auditors and become the member of European Wilderness Network representing the high alpine peaks with the glaciers and post-glacial landscape. This area is also famous because it used to have the huge glaciers already a couple, de couple decades ago. Today there are a lot of uh, hectares of the land which has been uh, explored or uh, glaciers has been uh, melted and new land uh, pop up and slowly starts to be recovered by the 
poor vegetation, flowers, etc. So that's an interesting place to visit and study even this kind of spontaneous natural succession after the retreat of the glaciers. Okay. Here we can see the few example of diversity. The picture just illustrate from the tree line consists of the spruce and large alp alpine uh, sp subspecies to the highest part of the mountains with the uh, glacial lakes, rocks and uh, small fragments of the melted uh, glaciers. Uh, uh, there are also a number of the animals attractive which occupy this area like uh, chamois and also ibex which has been reintroduced already several decades ago in this area and from the from the birds uh, it's a griffon vulture birded vulture golden eagle so some nice really representative example of the wilderness symbolic animals and birds okay this picture again showing you different habitat types in this area, very top of the mountains with the small glaciers, uh, valleys which has been formed by the much, much higher, uh, bigger glacier than we can see today. Uh, the alpine meadows and uh, stretch uh, far away about the tree line, which has been quite heavily used in the past decades, especially after the Second World War. But then later on, the area has been abandoned because of remoteness and also because of economic of the country change. And then finally, the park management managed to create an area with this uh, more than 6,000 hectares with any kind of extractive use, but open for people. There is a quite nice network of the trails, including the mountain hut at the, big, at the border of the wilderness where people can stay overnight and explore and experience this uh, unique part of the wilderness uh, in, in the middle of Europe. Okay. So let's move a little bit north from Hohe Tauren, still in Austria, and let's uh, visit the shortly Kalkalpen wilderness. Kalkalpen wilderness is located in the northern part of the northern edge of the Alp, Al, uh, Alps, Alp mountains and stretching over the 13,000 hectares. The habitat is completely different. It's a limestone, steep limestone mountains, but they're reaching uh, just a couple hundred meters above the tree line. So it is not so spectacular as the Hohe Tower and no glaciers at all, completely different habitats. And therefore it is very attractive and interesting place to visit and uh, see what is going on there. This area became the member of European Wilderness Network in 2015. And uh, because of the commitment of the manager, the top manager director of this area, who spent most of his life actually to, in some extent, recreate the wilderness in this area. Because you have to understand that area was created uh, 20, 25 years ago. And that was area which has been quite heavily used in, in uh, since the first, first World War for forestry, mining, etc. So there was a lot of forest road build up in the past, a lot of extractive use, even the grazing. And, uh, but during the, during the, this, this 20, 25 years when the park was created, the director with a dream in his mind, he starts to create it step-by-step non-intervention zone. And basically step-by-step, step, he removed the forestry, he moved the, the any kind of extractive use like, like uh, grazing from the some area which is now on the map marked as a green and created the land where the mother nature is slowly recovering. And we can see how abundant forest road are slowly eaten by nature, overgrown, etc. A lot of dynamics happening there. So there is a lot of forest, a lot of forestry activities around it has to be said, but because of last fragments of all the beach forest, the, the part of this protected area has been also included as a UNESCO World Heritage Beach Forest element. Okay. This is an example of biodiversity representing this area. We have the uh, chamois, alpine chamois, and uh, also we can find here wolf, lynx, which has been reintroduced and uh, with some difficulties and challenges. 
On the right hand side of the picture, we can see the chamois in an area which has been burned uh, circa 10, 12 years ago, and then slowly starts uh, recovering by due, due to the spontaneous natural processes. Nevertheless, the area was also heavily damaged after the rain by the soil erosion because of steep slopes and very thin soil on the limestone ground. So we can see also here a lot of attractive birds, rosalia beetle, bear moth, etc. More than 1,000 plant species, which is one third of the all Austrian flora. So it's a quite unique area because of the different different uh, geological background comparable with the uh, granite in uh, Hohe Tauren. Here it is uh, mostly sediments like limestone, dolomites, etc. Okay. As I said, uh, we have the category wild forest and this is an example. This is again the map of the Kalkalpa National Park and the green line is showing the category of the wild forest, fragments of the beach forest which has been identified and explored and marked on this map which is also part of UNESCO World Heritage Site in the size of uh, more than 5,000 hectares since 2015. And uh, this area also has been uh, awarded after the successful wilderness audit by the platinum uh, quality standard because it created together with the Kalkalpen Wilderness and Kalkalpen Wild Forest one extensive unit reaching more than 10,000 hectares. Okay. Here we can see the few uh, examples of the beauty and the diversity of habitats. On the left hand side top, we can see the example from the UNESCO, UNESCO beach forest, wild forest uh, with uh, all the fragments of the beach, uh, similar picture of the below. And then uh, scenery of the limestone mountains uh, with the broadleaf forest, uh, uh, gradually transform to the tree line where is a little bit spruce but nice field of the dwarf pine which build up the tree line in this area. It is still like it is limestone but there are still few attractive lakes inside of this area which increase the attractiveness of, of this area. Okay next one please. Let's move a little bit more north still in Austria, but at the border with the Czech Republic. And then we have an interesting place, what we can say transboundary, transboundary wilderness. Podi from the Czech side and Tietal from the Austrian side. Uh, what, this area is very interesting because that's uh, in a very heavily used land. In the Central Europe, all around there is intensively used agricultural land from the Austrian side, a little bit forest. Area is actually quite small, so there was a lot of discussions how to do how to deal with this area because there was a strong interest on the both sides of the boundary. We have to remind that this area used to be the Iron Curtain during the communism time. So from Czech side, it was quite well protected due to the military service. On the Austrian side, there was still ongoing a lot of forestry preparation, and only since Velvet Revolution in Czechoslovakia. There was an intention and um, things starts to move and there was a created transboundary protected area with the two different administra administrative units. But both units agreed that we, they try to create transboundary international wilderness. And after the years, they developed the plan and slowly starts to implement it. This story, this, this process was basically also one of the important elements during the audit process where, manager, where auditors come to the conclusion that actually these international recognitions can significantly support the process of creating the new wilderness in the Central Europe, despite of the small size regarding the hectares. Because as you can see here, Taital, they have a 300 hectares since 2018, and Podi wilderness on the Czech side only 254. However, there are there is a potential for spe uh, sp specifically on the Czech side significantly increase the size of wilderness almost up to the 1000 hectares. So that uh, these international recognitions is basically uh, giving the hand and help to this area to become the well-known piece of uh, small wilderness in a central Europe. Okay. 
We can see the habitats here, the meadows, which has been made by men and slow and still maintained by the artificial act and, uh, and active uh, cutting to maintain that this, this biodiversity. But once you cross the border between the meadow and the forest, you enter the nice spontaneously develop the forest and that processes are very much visible. In the central part of current wilderness, we can see the river Die or Taya, which is a border between Czech on our side and Austria on the other side of the river. And this meander is a nice example of the wilderness or character of wilderness which is offering in this part of the Europe. There are more than 83 types of mixed deciduous forest types with a dry grassland, more than 10,000 species of intervertebrates, which has been uh, recently in, uh, interview, uh, monitored and uh, find out, very, very large diversity of birds and mammals, including the wildcat, threatened bats, black stores. Very high plant biodiversity, more than 1,300 species like lady, sleeper orchids, iris, and etc. Next one, please. These both uh, parts uh, are connected by the river, what uh, become the, also part of this network in the category of wider river. It's only two kilometers long, but uh, again, with a potential to enlargement, because there is a still in some element or some segments of this river inside the park, there is a still fishing accepted and allowed. And that's a long-term process, how these fishermen should be taken out. This river is creating extraordinary scenery and uh, offered also good interesting habitat for a number of uh, fish species which are uh, living in this river. Okay, next one. Few pictures illustrating the habitats, what are in, inside of this uh, interesting small area in the middle of Europe, the forest, river, relict bore, uh, uh, pines on the steep slopes above the river, etc. Okay. Okay, let's move to the Balkan, Balkan Peninsula, uh, Bulgaria. The protected area, Central Balkan, located in the central part of Bulgaria. And this uh, two, four, six, eight, eight elements or eight islands of the green color create the eight old state reserves in a total size more than 20,000 hectares. So it's a quite, each of them is quite significant size. Since 2003, it becomes a member of this European wilderness network and uh, in, represent the fragments of the old growth Rodope mixed forest, alpine meadows, and also the old growth beach forest. And uh, some of these green areas also belongs to this UNESCO beach forest network. Area has been because of size and quality of uh, wilderness awarded by the platinum label already in 2003. Good, next one, please. We now see the, the very various biodiversity. We are still in a kind of sub Mediterranean region and there are circa 200 uh, bird species like Imperian or Golden Eagle habitat, very good habitat for um, uh, predators like wolf, bear, even the otter in the river, red deer, and uh, high up to the mountains, a very specific subspecies of the chamois. Good. Pictures of showing the different habitats. We can see the steep, rugged slopes, which are basically currently inaccessible. There is no trails, no extractive views at all. This is a very nice wilderness on the left-hand side. On the bottom left side, we can see the character of the mountain ridge of the Central Balkan. Again, pretty, pretty wild and remote area. And uh, on the right hand side on top, we can see the area which are outside of wilderness. Wilderness is actually on the left hand side, these steep rocky slopes. But then on the right hand side of this picture, we can see the line in the middle, which is an old, old road used during the communism era to bring the pastures and sheep high up to the mountains, which is now very, very rarely happening. Good. Next one, please. Okay, let's move from Bulgaria quickly a little bit north uh, to the Romania. And we, can, we will visit uh, one of uh, oldest protected area in uh, Southern Carpathians. 
Red Desert, Red Desert National Park and the Red Desert Wilderness. This park was already audited as a last, one of the last fragment of the Carpathian wilderness in 2004 in a size of more than 10,000 hectares and reached the platinum quality level as well because of size and because of quality of that, of, of that uh, nature, which has not been used already for several decades. Basically no, no hunting, no, no hunting, no, no grazing and no uh, forestry operation. This, these green areas inside the park represent steep, unaccessible mountains, old growth conifer forest, and what is very unique, there are more than 54 glacial lakes high up to the mountains, which makes this Retezad one of uh, Carpathian mountains with the highest number of glacia glacial lakes. Okay. We can see here habitats and uh, diversity linked to these habitats. About 330 threatened plant species can be identified here because the area is built up partially by limestone and sediment mountains and the center part with the highest peak almost 2500 meters is uh, built up by granite and uh, schist. So it's a very diverse geological background which uh, definitely reflect the high biodiversity. There are 55 mammal species, including roe or red deer, a Carpathian chamois, badger, otter, wild boar, but also full spectrum of typical Carpathian carnivores like wolf, lynx, brown bear, and wildcat. Also area where the eagles uh, find the, the habitat and nesting space, thanks to the remoteness and uh, size of this wilderness. Thanks. Show pictures of showing old growth forest, mixed uh, broad leaves, uh, climbing a little bit higher up, we can find the spruce and the conifer forest, even with the zebra pine. And uh, bottom, there is a typical spring flower, crocus hoifeliano, shafran crocus. And then the habitats of the Carpathian uh, spruce forest and one of these 54 glacial lakes high up to the mountains above the tree line. Number of them are very famous tourist destination. Area is accessible by, by the network of tourist trails. Right after the communism collapse, there was a, a group of the active people and the newly created management team. And they spent a lot of efforts and time and capacity to clean up this area, collecting all garbage and waste and uh, now this area is offering quite nice wide wilderness experience for people who are uh, willing to hike on their own. Okay. <clears throat> Rila, coming back south, back to the Bulgaria for a short visit. We go south from the Sofia to the mountains, uh, which is named Rila Mountain and uh, wilderness more than 16,000 hectares, including two big parts, was created uh, in 2005, so already quite quite a bit time ahead. And uh, that create, uh, include uh, one of the largest part of the Carpathia, of the, sorry, of the Bulgarian mountains, covered with the alpine meadows, old grow mixed forest, uh, that reached the quality of the platinum level. Thank you. Biodiversity. Again, very, very high. We are still partially in the southern part of Europe, part of a Mediterranean wider region, 1500 species of plants, almost 300 endemic intervertebrates, habitat, good habitat for wolf, uh, bear, even lynx can be found rarely here, copper kelly, hazel grouse, and uh, mountain eagles also. You can see from this picture on the, left hand, on the right hand side, that mountains are nice, scenic, a lot of tourist trail as well with a network of mountain huts, which sometimes are close to the uh, wilderness zone. Some of them are even inside and they have a, uh, they, are now, they are now working on a specific uh, regime, how to handle the, the, this uh, operation process. Good, next one. <coughs> Different habitats, old forest with a wild river, Alpine lakes on, on the bottom with uh, alpine vegetation. And uh, winter, obviously, it's uh, 
scenic and provide a special feeling in these remote mountains where only brave uh, individual skiers can get in. Okay, next one, please. Okay, let's move more to the east and we are in the middle of Turkey. Middle of Turkey on the northern edge, right at the border with the Black Sea line. There is a massive of the mountains, Curia Mountains, all built up by the limestone area, where top of the mountains, basically plateau and deep, deep canyon, cutting this mountain ridge uh, in the middle, uh, were, proposed, were audited and were proposed to become the part of European wilderness network. This, this wilderness is reaching uh, more than 26,000 hectares, so reach the platinum quality standard. It's really remote and extensive. It uh, all process happened in uh, 2012, and since then they are member of this European wilderness network. It is a high mountains of intact forest hotspots in Turkey. That was actually also one of the area identified by Global WWF office as a one of a very rare and, and very valuable biodiversity a global hotspot. And that was one of the reasons why they created the new park and since the beginning they become and they bought the context concept of the wilderness and they created strictly protected zone of the wilderness inside of this area which by the way in the past was quite heavily used by grazing and local people. There is a still ongoing activity around particularly in this brownish area outside of the core area outside of wilderness. Next one please. The biodiversity is really interesting and nice. So on the left, on the right hand side, you can see the extensive uh, forest, uh, almost uh, no signs of the presence of the humans, no roads, mixed forests with a lot of, uh, for us, Central Europeans, uh, quite exotic species inside. Forests dominated by conifers and deciduous trees globally endangered area provide a habitat for globally endangered Egyptians, eagle, vultures, falcon, uh, etc. And uh, from the bigger animals, from bigger mammals, uh, wildcat, otter in a river, in a clean river, brown bear and, and, and uh, deer. Okay, next one, please. Habitats, different habitats. From the first picture, we can see the scenic mountains this, with this uh, Kure Canyon, which is one of the largest canyon in this part of Turkey, very uh, high touristic attraction, but not easy accessible. Bottom On the bottom of the left hand side, we can see the very attractive and interesting flowering, the rhododendron, which is growing on the northern slope of the mountains, close to the uh, impact or influence of the sea. A lot of fog in this area during the springtime and summer. And then we see the old forest and a lot of limestone canyon with the, with the, uh, the creeks and a rear cutting through, through from the mountains, from the top of the mountains towards the sea or towards the interior part of, of the Turkey. Okay, next one. Borjomi Karagauli, we are far, far away at the eastern corner of Europe in Georgia one of the very first protected area created after the Soviet era, after the Soviet Union collapsed. It was again international project supported by the World Bank. And since the beginning, they come with an idea, an interest to identify the wilderness, that means non-intervention area. Nevertheless, we have to understand that this area used to be during the Soviet era, very much used by the local forestry and grazing but that quite rapidly changed after the revolution due to the economical reasons and remoteness of this area. This area become more than for 20 years, pretty much abandoned. And uh, a lot of visitors starts to coming here and explore this remote corner of the Lesser Caucasus. The park in that moment invested a lot of uh, facilities, capacity and uh, resources to build up the network of tourist trails so people can actually follow up on their own the several trails. They can stay overnight in the middle of area. There are some simple uh, facilities and open cabins where people can stay overnight. Nevertheless, even today, throughout the park and throughout the wilderness, we can find a lot of results of the previous extractive use 
pretty much a network of the abandoned uh, forest roads, which are very visible, especially in the alpine zone above the tree line. Only signs uh, that there is no one going extractive uses anymore, at least in some part of this area. These roads are completely overgrown by the green vegetation. Usually grass, which is showing actually that there is a minimum or none motorized transport inside this green area of wilderness. So the size is enormous, 50, more than 50,000 hectares. The area is, by the way, in a process uh, of uh, uh, re-audit because of, of uh, time when the first audit happened. And uh, it is the largest wilderness in European wilderness network currently. And uh, also belongs to the biodiversity, World Biodiversity Conservation Hotspot. And uh, mountains are mostly covered by conifer forest and, uh, and uh, attractive vegetation on the limestone, uh, limestone bedrock. Okay. We can see a few pictures from this area. On the left hand side, actually, we see the alpine zone, which was proposed to become the wilderness. And there was a quite discussions uh, with our auditors because of this road we can see and uh, some erosions because of steep slope. But on that road, uh, on the opposite side, we can see that the road is quite nicely overgrown by the vegetation, so likely not used already for several years, maybe decade. And uh, that was recommended by auditors that let's invite, involve this area to the wilderness so we can prevent uh, renew uh, pasture activity if it can happen in the future. The area provides a lot of biodiversity because of this history and geological background and uh, locality inside of the Georgia. There are many rare and endemic flora and fauna species. Large uh, carnivores represent bear, wolf and lynx. From herbivores, red deer, chamois high up to the mountains, and the more than 217 birds, including Caucasus, black grouse, or bee eater. Okay. So this is a picture of scenery and habitat and uh, geomorphology of this area. So we can see a lot of mountains, ridge after ridge, no roads, or if there are roads that are mostly abandoned or not used anymore, so eroded. A lot of people, visitors, if they go there, that's a usually two, three days walk minimum to get there and explore. There is also one day options, but then you can reach only, usually only the edges of this wilderness area, passing or crossing the buffer zones. And uh, it's an attractive area and interesting place uh, for biodiversity, but also for the visitors. Okay. Next one, please. So that was a portfolio of examples of the existing audited wilderness in Central Europe. We travel from Portugal and we ended up on the other corner of the Europe in Georgia. This is uh, just a few pictures illustrating the process during the audit, monitoring discussion with local people. Some of these pictures are from uh, Kalkalpen, other from from uh, even from Slovakia, from the area which is uh, has a potential to become the uh, wilderness, but management, current management is not very exciting, but the quality is there. That was already verified several times. On, uh, on the top left side, we see the auditors with the local team uh, discussing about the map in the Kalkalpen wilderness, etc. So next one, please. So help us fight for Europe last wilderness. So this is uh, one of the last slide uh, asking people and you as a participants of these uh, presentations for your help, for your suggestions, recommendations, because you have your knowledge, your, ne your network, you know, I believe many, many more areas. And uh, we are simply searching for, first of all, for piece of abandoned land where the, without any extractive use, and the piece of land where the local managers understand and have an intention or interest at least to discuss how to implement and how to continue with the implementation of non-extractive use and create that area as a wilderness. So if you think that uh, you know that kind of area, you can use this kind of uh, email contact and uh, support this process or simply just uh, become the member of European or supporter of European Wilderness Network 
and become our supporters. So thank you for your support in advance and hopefully to have a discussion and uh, see you sometimes uh, somewhere in the European Union. Next one, please. I also would like to use this opportunity using this picture from Ukraine where the next presentation, next presentations of the third part of European Wilderness Network will focus on Ukraine, on the eastern corner of Europe. We focus, we decided to make this specific presentation with a focus on Ukraine because first of all, we have quite a number of areas there because since the beginning when the communism collapsed, there was a part of the people very attractive and interesting to cooperate with European Wilderness Society and we also find out that there is a still a lot of things left since the Soviet era, which fit to the European wilderness quality standard, particularly in this Carpathian region in the eastern, uh, western part of Ukraine. So on May of 5th, which is a two weeks since now, at three o'clock Central European time, you are more than welcome to come and attend the third very webinar focusing on European wilderness network we will be discussing and presenting experience with the wilderness stewardship in, a, in a Ukraine and showing a lot of uh, nice locations, but also a lot of challenges which this country is facing now. So think about this and in a two weeks time, three o'clock, we can meet again, have a discussions and, uh, and, and uh, presentations like this. Next one, please. So, more information can be found here on this website. You can find it on, 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 on this uh, picture. And the uh, slides on the left-hand side is showing uh, one of our colleagues, or maybe it's me actually, in, uh, in uh, Bulgaria. That's at the border with, uh, with uh, Greece. Uh, by the way, we spent the last uh, autumn quite a bit time in this country where we managed with the support with local managers to identify six additional potential wilderness areas, starting from Danube River at the border with Romania and went through the mountains and we ended up at the border with Greece. This is a very remote area with very little bit of people, even visitors are very rare there. Area used to be heavily grazed, but not anymore. There are just few small signs of abundant grazing zones and beautiful forest, beautiful beach forest uh, below these mountains. So likely this area become the member of European Wilderness Network very soon. This is just a little bit from our plan of what we 